Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. We're here today to talk about the health record. This is actually a very interesting chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the text actually, so I know I say that about a lot of them, but this is really interesting. Electronic health records, the health record, it's gone through a number of changes and it's important for you to be aware of those changes and then also to be aware of the complexity and the laws regulating healthcare practices from the relation of the health record. So that's some important information and we're going to go over as much as possible today. We're not going to talk about the objectives you're able to read through that. We're going to talk a little bit about the High Tech Act and you can actually Google this. I think it's going to be interesting for you if you are interested in doing that. We'll give an overview of that and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means for electronic health records. So the High Tech Act was meant to encourage the use of health information technology, right? So we transition from paper charts into electronic charts and we're talking mainly hospital large healthcare systems that use Medicare and Medicaid funding. Now there still are some you know groups that maybe charge just uh, out-of-pocket expenses and they don't uh, use health records but it's highly recommended now and your reimbursement is based on that. So the High Tech Act also created incentives using EHRs and it also created penalties for not using electronic health records in relation to your funding from government payers. So that's a little bit about the High Tech Act. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background of when it was pushed through. One second, I'm going to pull that up. We go to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services website. It talks about it being in 2009. It was kind of during the time where we had the Affordable Care Act, right? We were trying to change our healthcare system, and it has made healthcare safer by using electronic health records. However, they're very costly, and there's a lot of things that uh, challenge healthcare systems from the perspective of using it. The change from a paper record to electronic health record, I was a part of this process in many different institutions. It is very, very challenging, and you have to do it right. So it's usually a lot of money, and once you get started, you can't stop. So that's one of the kind of platforms that I have from the experience based on changing from paper record to electronic record. But you can read more about the High Tech Act and the reason for it uh, in the Health and Human Services website. Back over to the lecture. All right, moving on. Electronic health records, they provide authority to establish programs to improve the health care safety and efficiency through the promotion of health information technology. So you've heard about these big vendors like Epic, Cerner. Those are massive vendors that provide health care technology to these clinics, hospitals, systems. So they're the one great thing that I would think people forget about with electronic records is when a patient goes into the office, if they're on the same record as the hospital, for an example, or some other place, they're going to have those records immediately available. Now, on paper records, right, sometimes the patient had to take information with them. They might forget it. It might be stored in the hospital. They go to a clinic, which is off-site. They might not have the same information. So it really helps uh, ER, EHRs and uh providers talk to each other in an effective way. Um, and I know this says not all EHRs talk to each other. Yeah, that's very true. Different vendors don't, but the majority of systems, if you're, if you have Epic, right? Epic as an example, let's say all of Puget Sound for Providence and Swedish is on Epic. They all communicate with each other. And that's kind of the, one of the partnership platforms that people use from the perspective of, Hey, this is why we should partner. We should be able to talk to each other. We have a lot of shared patients. All right, so there's confidentiality, right, with electronic health records. HIPAA addresses issues of patient confidentiality and privacy. We've talked about HIPAA before. Electronic storage also makes things easier in regards to storage from a Privacy Act. You know, there are hackers that can get into electronic health records, but these big systems have a lot of protections in place that help prevent that ha from happening. They really do help with patient privacy because things are stored in the cloud and the cloud of course has a lockdown from the perspective of what vendor you have and they're really able to take care of things in a in a I think a better way than we did with paper records so there's a large amount of types of health records right you're gonna have different types from the perspective of hospital records clinic records you're also gonna have differences between behavioral health records and records that any anyone in your clinician family can read 
give you a perspective of just from Epic because that's what I'm used to. You know, our Epic system does have a hospital module and it has a clinic module. Everything's stored in the same system, but you have to navigate two different parts of the record in order to get information on where the patient's record might be. So if they have a hospital record, say they were in the ED for an extended amount of time, that's going to be in the hospital module. And if they have a clinic record, it's going to be in the clinic module. But it kind of meshes things together so doctors don't oversee uh, issues that might arise. Like you don't want to treat some patient uh, if they've already been treated for that before or do something that might be dangerous based on, you know, maybe they were prescribed in bed in the hospital. You don't want to over prescribe or do something that would uh, contradict what they're already having done. All right. So that talks a little bit about the integrated health record. There's sometimes issues with this, like limited cross indexing between hospitals and offices. We don't really have an issue with that when you talk about large um, large programs like Cerner and uh, Epic. Hospital records rarely include direct report of medical office visits outside the hospital. That's not really true in large systems. Um, depending on where you're at, maybe small critical access hospitals deal with this. Uh, health records require the same confidentiality, of course, and we've talked about that. Who owns the health record? This is a great question. It's probably going to be a test question. Make sure you realize what the right answer is. So state law determines who owns a patient's health record. Property right is a right to ownership of a certain thing. Ownership usually is carried as an exclusive right to exercise authority and use of the property. So Epic is owned by the system at large, but the hospital, the healthcare system pays Epic to use their system. So the health record, when it's generated by a provider, most of the time it's technically owned by that provider's office. And I know a lot of people get confused on this. Of course, we can't do anything from the perspective of a patient um, not wanting us to use our record in a certain way, right? We're bound by those laws. However, the person that wrote the document usually owns the document. And that, that provides a, a level of accountability, right? So if a provider writes something in the record, they're accountable to it because they, of course, own it. Uh, but from that perspective, there are different state laws that protect against this. There are state laws that protect against patients' rights in the medical record. So there are going to be differences state by state. That's why um, one of the many reasons a patient can't just go into their health record and change anything, right? If they own it, they could go in and change something. And that might not really be in the best interest of the patient. You have to actually request a change from the provider's office. That's just one example. All right, we're not going to go over the knowledge check, but who has access to the health record? Of course, hospitals and providers who have policies and procedures for releasing patient information. Uh, and the policies have to reflect state, state law. Anyone in your healthcare sphere that is actually treating you as a patient has access to your record. Um, from that perspective, anyone outside that sphere, if they don't need to be involved, they're not going to have access to your record. Now, they might have access to the medical side of billing or something like that, but you know, we try to differentiate between the two, and a lot of systems do a good job of making sure billers only access that type of information, and of course, clinicians access the other information that they need in order to be successful. Those are usually separated. So the HIPAA and medical record transmission. So HIPAA was put in place back in 1996, and it's widely known for standard, standardizing guidelines to protect privacy, and it did a really good job of that. So when we transmit uh, medical records, it has to be over secure, a, a secure platform. So employees always have a policy about this. It's got to be over a secure email or fax. You know, we're told in our organization when we send an email, it's got to be of course, within network, you don't want to send anything outside of network because it's not secure. And if you do, or if you have to, maybe you're sending it to a payer or a, um, you know, maybe a government payer or even maybe like a insurance company that's within your sphere of influence. You have to make sure that email is secured. Maybe it's over encrypted email, something like that, just to make sure you're taking care of the patient's record based on what HIPAA guidelines are. So a patient does have access to their health record, depending on whether or not it's safe. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides further safeguards, which were implemented in 2020, that supports patients' access to records, and it also carries out the Cures Act. Hey, what's the Cures Act? So the 21st Century Cures Act 
uh, which of course was passed in the U.S. House, but it's meant to give the NIH, National Institutes of Health, flexibility and resources needed to accomplish this mission, right? So it implements measures to alleviate administrative burdens that start clinical trials, allow research to attend scientific conferences, it enhances data sharing, and also improves uh, and protects information from that perspective. But an easier way to think about this, the easiest way, as I mentioned, to think about this is the Cures Act allows seamless transition of medical information when it's, necess when it's a necessity for patient care. So it's another law that helps transition things in a quicker manner. So families access to innocent parties and their records. So providers argue they may be information family members should not see behavioral health as an example, and providers have a responsibility to maintain accurate records and preserve information. HIPAA does require certain information be provided regardless of a provider's wishes. Innocent party in the health record. When a family member participates in counseling with a patient, health records may not be disclosed without a patient's consent. So that's what I'm talking about. From that perspective, even if they're participating in the care, a patient actually has to sign a release in order to have information sent to family members. And it's a patient's right uh, to control that part of release from their record. So that's one of the laws that I'm talking about. Even though a patient doesn't technically own their record, they do have a right to deny it being released to family members or certain members that might have a negative impact on their overall well-being. However, that's up for the patient to decide. Do not disclose information about a patient unless instructed otherwise by law or your employer. That's, of course, a HIPAA violation. That's a release of information. You do have to have that in order to release information to a patient. So information should not be released unless the request has time limits, purpose, and a particular uh, and particular information that is being sought, of course. Health records may not be withheld pending payment of a bill. So I think that's a safeguard, right, for patients who might have a challenge from the perspective of insurance. Maybe they went to the ED, cost them a lot of money. They still are able to access a health record and get the care they need, even if they're not able to pay. And that, that, of course, is not everywhere. That's only for government-funded groups, right? So if you go to the ED, the ED has to be regulated from the perspective of um, a medical screening exam. So MTALA protects that. Uh, and some clinics might be different, right? So some clinics might be cash pay. They don't take government payers. They are able to turn patients away. However, hospitals are not. So capacity and consent to release information. This talks a little bit about um, releasing information uh, to maybe you know someone who needs an executor, administrator, someone, someone that has a release. Uh, normally, a parent or guardian can access. This is a very important part. Let me repeat this again. Normally, a parent or guardian can access their medical record for minors. However, minors can consent in the following circumstances to not have their medical record released, or they have to have a consent to release that medical record. So a minor has to consent to releasing a medical record for drug abuse, sexually transmitted disease or diagnosis, living away from home, anything in relation to that, self-supporting or marriage. So minors can consent not to release their medical record to an adult parent for any of these following items. And that's rare, right? Most of the time there is, of course, camaraderie between a minor, a minor and the patient, but we have seen times where minors say, I don't want, you know, my medical record released to my parents because of challenges that I've had, and we have to hold firm to that. Attorneys, of course, can also request information, um, maybe medical malpractice charges, things like that. Healthcare providers may respond indifferently. Some attorneys might find it easy, easier to engage in a formal discovery, so they probably, most of the time, are going to have to have a subpoena to get the information, and that's really the safest method because the judge signs off on it. So subpoena gathers that information rather than just releasing it to attorneys. Um, we can't just release medical information to attorneys anyway. They have to have a reason, and a subpoena protects from that, protects the practice from unnecessary right release of information. Release forms, right? We talked about a subpoena just a minute ago. It's necessary to force production of, of health records, and then it is also written in order to produce a document. Uh, this is a Latin term, right? And I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it just means, right, to release information based on the need of, of, of a case or a court 
decision. So credibility health record, we're actually going to stop the video here and start video number two.